Hello everyone from Berlin. I like to speak about open source magnetic resonance imaging. And uh, before doing that, <clears throat> uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present at this conference. I have nothing to disclose. I would like to start the talk with um, clarifying what open source actually means. If we apply an open source license to a piece of hardware, we basically grant the right to study, the right to modify, the right to distribute and sell, and the right to make hardware based on this design. Uh, and this right goes to everyone, um, non-exclusively. So if we apply these four rights of open source to our MR microcosmos, uh, basically magic happens. Or at least that is what uh, I believe and what many other scientists believe and supporters of uh, the open source imaging initiative. Um, because our goal is simple, we want to have an open source MRI in the clinic. Uh, and when we have that, we believe that there are many areas where the value of transparency and the freedom to share would have a huge impact. So just imagine, if all the MR machines and other lab devices were open source today, uh, and additionally, if all publications that you are reading were posting additional code, hardware designs, and data, um, what implications would that have for you and your life as a scientist, engineer, and patient? And to elaborate a little bit more on that and give you some food for thought, so if we could establish an open source science uh, as a gold standard, we could reduce the time and resources spent to reproduce already published results. We would find more errors and we would focus more on advancing knowledge. <clears throat> of course, training and education of students and staff would be easier. We would have more companies, more customization and innovation in the products. There would be more competition on the market. So devices would be eventually cheaper and more accessible. We could repair and maintain the devices easier and for a lower cost. Uh, and probably the quality, reliability and safety of machines could be investigated and improved by many more people. So safety guidelines and their implementations could be harmonized as well worldwide. Um, so there's a lot of dreams, um, but we have to start somewhere. And this start basically focuses first on building an MRI, right? Um, obviously, we cannot start with a superconducting magnet in a lab environment, um, but we can do that with um, low field MRI, um, working with permanent magnets, uh, which is relatively affordable to reconstruct by other research institutions. Uh, it's relatively small um, and it could have also <clears throat> a clinical impact. It's actually amazing what happened in the last years with uh, open source hardware design um, and, and software as well. So um, there was a lot of progress, many groups sharing their designs and code, uh, and this was super helpful. Um, so on this slide, you can see all hardware components that are required to build an MRI. And I will show you some examples for each part uh, that is needed um, uh, and that is um, either already available or will be available very soon um, um, as open source hardware. So here are two examples for the magnet. Uh, in Berlin, we are working on a small desktop magnet, 10 centimeter bore, around three to four centimeter field of view. And in Leiden, uh, there is a large bore Halbach magnet, uh, which was already used for head and knee imaging. We have some RF power amplifier designs, uh, one kilowatt, uh, kilowatt peak power each. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, it's a design we, we did initially in, in Berlin some time ago. And here's a newer uh, design by the Technical University of Delft, where the documentation is available soon. Then we have some gradient power amplifiers. Uh, we have um, the current driver board uh, from the MGH MIT group on the left hand side. Um, we have um, a similar board with four channels and 10 amps um, by the University of Applied Science in Dortmund. Um, and we have a slightly more powerful um, gradient amplifier with 30 amps um, by the Technical University of Delft. Then we have some software tools uh, that can basically calculate the wiring pass so that gradient coils can be built, such as this one on this photo here. And um, there is uh, um, one from the group in Leiden Delft. Then there is um, a tool from Freiburg and there is a tool um, from Lübeck. For the console, we can, for example, use a red pit higher uh, to play out the pulses and uh, receive a signal. And this is um, 
by the MIT MGH group um, um, provided with a code that's named Okra. And another approach is using a GNU radio based, um, a GNU radio compatible uh, software defined radios um, with a piece of code that is also designed uh, in a way uh, to pl uh, play out um, MR pulse sequences. Uh, and this is from the Thunderbolt University. And then for the software, so if we really want to have a more pulse sequence development that is hardware independent, uh, we could use tools such as PulseSec uh, coming from Freiburg. Um, and this allows us to basically do in parallel um, pulse sequence um, development and hardware development. And here are some um, ISRMM abstracts, recent ISRMM abstracts that uh, use this tool. So when we put these pieces together, um, we already have some complete systems and uh, starting off with the first, it's the uh, Okra tabletop. It's an open source desktop MR system. Uh, as you can see here, it fits on the desk. Um, it has a relatively small field of view, but for educational purposes, um, that's great. It, get, it gives um, um, very good imaging uh, performance uh, and it originally was designed by the MIT MGH. Uh, and um, Magdeburg also successfully rebuilt it and um, also extended the func its functionality. Then in Berlin, uh, we built um, a magnet that is slightly uh, bigger and uh, a bit more colorful, as you can see on this uh, photo of the students. Um, and here we, uh, it's also a collaborative effort. We have um, some first image uh, in the prototype and we are working on a, sec a second version to basically put it all together uh, and then um, uh, document it. And here you can see a larger bore system, uh, which can be used for head or knee imaging. Uh, this is uh, in Leiden University Medical Center, uh, collaboration partners from Delft, Penn State and Marara University. And the prototype showed already some nice first knee images that you can appreciate here. And uh, this uh, system will be also rebuilt and certified uh, for uh, clinical imaging in children in uh, Uganda. The nice thing about all these um, efforts um, uh, to, to build an open source uh, MRI, either for educational purposes or, or for clinical imaging, is that it's not really um, a competition. It's, it's, it's a nice collaboration. And this is in general something that is true uh, if you engage in this in an, let's say, open source way of doing things. Um, so each component that is used uh, um, in, in this system, for example, uh, could be also, might be also uh, applicable in another um, MR scanner. Uh, so there's a lot of exchange of, comp um, of ideas, knowledge, uh, etc. So I could hopefully show you that um, we are getting there. We nearly have our open source MR scanners available um and this is great this is great news uh, but we are not there yet so uh, we still need to do a bit of extra work on some other fields and um so when i have a look at open source software which is by today a multi-billion um dollar uh, market uh, it kind of graduated it's mature it gets good quality and so on open source hardware start just started to walk which is great uh, but it still needs uh, a um needs to grow and um, open source medical technology in this sense is not born yet. So what do we need to do? Well, one thing that we worked on uh, is an open source hardware standard. So we have a first official standard on open source hardware. And uh, this is important because we need a clear definition of what open source hardware is if we talk about it. Um, and a second thing is um, that we need some type of quality assurance that if you download a certain design, that you can really rebuild the hardware and you don't get frustrated because with software, it doesn't cost you um, to, to, to download the software, but with hardware, you need to buy materials. Um, maybe you need some extra devices to build this piece of hardware. And when it doesn't work, you get frustrated. So um, in a way we have to do it a little bit more professional um, and a little bit more in a way that the industry is doing it since many years. But we can do more than that. So the chances also of this, this standard, and it's, this is a work in progress for the next uh, iterations, that we include uh, the product life cycles. 
such as repair and maintenance. So how can I repair my, my, my piece of open source hardware in the best way and what documentation do I need for that? Uh, or even recycling. Yeah? So how can I recycle uh, um, the individual components? Um, so this is more an approach of, of, of a circular economy, um, which is quite interesting. So the good news is that open source hardware is reproducible if the documentation is mature enough. And uh, here's an example of a positioning system uh, that has been rebuilt at different sites in different countries within Europe. Let me jump back into the bigger picture um, of why we want to have an open source MR system. Uh, healthcare has some challenges, which is increasing healthcare costs, monopolization in many healthcare sectors. It's not only in MRI, but in particular in MRI. Uh, and because of that, um, healthcare is far from available, accessible, appropriate and affordable globally, um, as defined by the World Health Organization. So we need to ask ourselves the question if technological innovations are enough or if there is a conflict of interest uh, between healthcare and the business model. So let me give you an example how an open source MR scanner can impact the public healthcare system. So here is the device market uh, and data taken from the German healthcare system. And we compared a commercial, commercially available MR scanner with an open source device of similar technical performance. From our experience of hardware development, we can roughly estimate material costs and assembly costs. Uh, and then we can replace one with the other uh, and project that onto 20 years. So basically you can see that after 20 years, you can save a lot of money for the public healthcare system. And the idea is that if we invest some of this money now into open source medical technology development or open source MR development, um, we can save a lot of money later. And uh, this is a very sustainable approach. It could be critical of the previous slide, basically arguing that the vendors have already a very cost efficient um, production process of MR scanners, uh, which cannot be further improved by, open source, uh, by an open source approach. So let me give you another example, because the total cost of ownership does not only consist of the purchasing price. So assuming that you cannot lower your purchasing price, what about the service market? Uh, you still have to pay uh, a fee or a percent of your purchasing price per year uh, for an MR scanner in order to repair and maintain it. And um, when we uh, take now data from the German healthcare system, and we assume that this percent is 6% of the initial purchasing price, um, an open source approach uh, would have an effect that we would have more competition on the service market. Why? Because the documentation is available um, of the system, so there's more transparency. Um, and this might also lead not only to, to more um, um, companies offering these this services, but it might also lead to um, more in-house maintenance of hospitals. Um, and then you could reduce this, um, this cost from six, uh, like in this example, to maybe 5% or 3% per year. Um, and you can see that again, after, after a couple of years, uh, you can save a lot of money for the public healthcare system. So I hope I could transmit you a little bit our vision of the many people involved in open source magnetic resonance imaging and show you a bit of our progress towards this goal. As we currently do things, the black box approach gives us quicker results. But if we talk about long-term sustainability, we have to apply an open source strategy. So what can you do as a researcher? You can join some of these many open source MR projects that are out there and help with your skills. Uh, you can also publish your code or design files alongside your publications or conference abstracts. Uh, then we are also happy to highlight it on opensourceimaging.org. Uh, you can edit some wiki pages. So we recently launched a wiki um, where we try to also put some content together, useful content together for um, uh, our community and then cross-link also to the open source uh, MR project. Um, and then basically just join the community. And so here you can see a hackathon that was in Montreal. Obviously it was um, before, um, before Corona. So there is no, no distance uh, in place. Um, but open source is also about globally connecting people. So in this particular case, uh, we had uh, all the continents connected uh, and it was quite interesting to see how, how people were sleeping in their offices um, uh, in, in order to be on time for their uh, pitch after this hackathon. So if you have more questions, just contact me 
and uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.